Abraham Lincoln warned that the philosophy of the schoolroom in one generation will be the philosophy of government in the next. Would you like to know what's being taught in today's classrooms? Welcome to Say What? with attorney Mark Schneider and Pastor George Roska Jr. They'll explore the issues facing children, parents, and society as a result of the public schools and the forces behind them. Say What? is the radio program of Protect Our Kids, which seeks to inform and equip concerned citizens about the looming crisis in American education. So listen in as your hosts, Mark Schneider and George Roska Jr., unpack the issues and organizations affecting our children. And now here's your hosts, Mark Schneider and George Roska Jr. Hello, everyone. I'm George Roska. And I'm Mark Schneider. And we want to welcome you to episode 124 of Say What, where we talk about the threats to our children in the public school system, including the determination of the school system working in conjunction with state governments and medical providers to enable the sterilization and mutilation of our nation's school children. And really what we're going to do today is we're going to be continuing from episode 123 of what we started, which were some very powerful testimonies, and we had to cut so much out. Um, and as Mark and I were talking um, after we did our recording on on episode 123, there was just too much good content that we we just really needed to share this with parents. So, so Mark, give us a, a summary of what did we talk about in in episode 123, and what do we want to bring forward here? Yeah, so this content comes out of the House Judiciary Subcommittee on the Constitution and Limited Government. They held hearings on a subject entitled The Dangers and Due Process Violations of Gender Affirming Care for Children. So uh, we showed a number of uh, testimony clips from that hearing. We didn't have time to get through them all. Um, the first one that we showed was uh, from a, a doctor who calls himself the gender queer surgeon, and he gave some chilling testimony about what he actually does in the surgical room to mutilate children in an attempt to transform their anatomy, which is not possible. And the fact that they have no clue what they're doing, they're learning and he said, "In five to ten years, we'll 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 see what's happening with these kids." He did, yeah. So it's, <laughs> the, by the way, George, these are all experimental procedures, even yes. though they're happening across the country. None of these have been improved. This, these are completely experiments on on kids, and yet they're being proffered as something. That, oh, this is safe for your child. This is what they need to prevent yep. further men, uh, mental health uh, decline issues. Well, uh, the next witness that we heard w- from was. Paula Scanlon, who is a former University of Pennsylvania swimmer, and she gave, I thought, riveting testimony talking about, uh, as a competitor in women's sports, competing against uh, males, uh, mainly uh, Leah Thomas, who his former name is Will uh, uh, Thompson. And this is a over six foot uh, four uh, a person who just dominated women's sports. And uh, was not a particularly competitive uh, a competitor as a male, but uh, <laughs> of course, as soon as he started competing in women's sports, he he dominated everything. And then finally, the last clip that we heard on last week's episode was from Chloe Cole. Of course, Chloe uh, has made something of a name for herself, unfortunately, as a detransitioner who has become an advocate, uh, trying to tell people, "Don't go where I went." Mm-hmm. I mean, her testimony is quite chilling yes. and riveting. Um, so, George, we should probably say all of this sort of revolves around this topic of gender affirming care, yes. uh, which once again, uh, it happens in stages and it usually occurs uh, when a child is starting prepuescence. So 11, 12 years old uh, around there. And as we've talked about many times on this program, the public schools are wor- working part and parcel to encourage kids to hide their gender transitioning from their own parents and work with third party medical providers to start this process. And it usually begins with um, a puberty blocker known as Lupron, which has terrible effects on the body. This is an off label uh, use of this drug. It's a man made drug. That will lead to uh, cross-sex hormones uh, for young women who are transitioning to a boy. They take testosterone for young boys that want to transition to a a girl. 
They take estrogen, extremely powerful drugs. And of course, this leads to body mutilation surgery, yep. which starts with top surgery, removing the breasts of a girl. And then it goes on to, we can't even describe it here. It, it's so terrible. Sickening. It really is. So uh, today we're going to hear from a couple of more witnesses who testified uh, during this hearing. The first one being Jennifer Bowens. Now, Jennifer is a, a PhD, and she also is the director for the Center of Family Studies on behalf of Family Research Council. And I think rather than us talk about what she's going to say, mm-hmm. it's probably best to hear from her directly. So why don't we go ahead and play the video of this testimony? Based on over 25 years of experience as a clinician providing trauma therapy to children and as a researcher investigating the psychological effects of traumatic uh, stress, I'm here to express my concern about what has been termed gender-affirming care. I've considered it a privilege to practice, research, and train future clinicians and be a part of a discipline aimed at protecting and bringing healing to the most vulnerable in our society, which are children. But when it comes to gender transition procedures, my field is not operating as a helping profession. Instead, it is actively causing harm. Historically, children have been treated as a special and vulnerable class in the psychological and research fields. Caution has been applied to children in light of the fact that they do not have the neurological capacity to understand lifelong decisions. Professional and research ethics tell us that we should proceed very cautiously with regard to interventions for children when empirical evidence is weak or the research methods are in the early phase, as with this case. We should avoid interventions that pose unnecessary risks, particularly when the symptoms are known to change with maturation. But risk avoidance is not what's happening with gender transition procedures. Instead, we have too many cases like Mike. Mike was nine years old when he first saw a gender therapist. I was deeply saddened when I read his gender therapist case notes where it was reported that Mike couldn't distinguish between fantasy and reality. Instead of investigating these symptoms, the therapist wrote in the treatment plan, um, which included puberty blockers, guidance on social transition, and education for future hormonal and surgical procedures. This treatment plan was enacted without regard for this child's known diagnoses of autism, possible OCD, and possible parental diagnoses, which were reported in the case notes. Mike is just one example of how so-called gender-affirming care is in direct opposition of of our knowledge regarding development and our understanding of good research and uh, treatment. And there are many reasons why I have concerns, but I'll just share a few with you. Uh, One, these interventions are being endorsed based on consensus, not evidence, uh, in, the, in the case of gender-affirming care, the term evidence-based does not mean that this practice is standing on the merits of solid research findings addressing gender dysphoria. Instead, it refers to a vote by those who are ideological supporters of the practice. Compared to other psychological disorders found in the DSM-5 TR, gender dysphoria is currently uh, being treated with the most invasive, invasive interventions connected to a psychological issue with the lowest quality of evidence to support that practice. And two, the success rates of non-intervention for gender dysphoria for children already exceed what most psychological interventions have. In most cases, 85% or more of those experiencing gender dysphoria will desist if they are left alone. This is a higher rate than most well-established and researched psychological interventions. And with success rates this high, it is actually unethical to intervene. Three, the research and practice around this uh, issue does not properly account for competing diagnoses and variables. So in one example, a report from the UCLA Williams Institute found that 45% of transgender-identifying people reported childhood sexual abuse. As a trauma clinician, I can tell you that when someone experiences sexual trauma, it is not uncommon for that person to hate parts of their body or want to get rid of those aspects of themselves that made them vulnerable to abuse. And four, it is often claimed that a failure to provide these interventions increases the risk for suicide. 
This approach is actually unethical, and it's a clear departure from the practice of empowerment and self-management, which are important goals of mental health practice. This claim is also not supported by the literature. Despite years of empirical study, there is no definitive understanding of the etiology in the suicide literature. Five, after a review of the literature, other countries have actually backed away from gender transition procedures, and the list now includes the United Kingdom, France, Finland, Norway, Australia, and Sweden. And six, last, uh, gendered affirming care has created a monopoly on treatment options as it demands that it is the only way to treat gender dysphoria. By comparison, um, we can look at uh, Cochrane Collaboration, for example. Um, There are 245 meta-analytic reviews of varied treatment options for depression. Yet when it comes to gender dysphoria, there's only one path currently prescribed to uh, help someone, and that's to become someone else. Researchers and clinicians should be innovating solutions to heal distress, not coercing kids onto a path that tells them that they need to remove or change physical parts of who they are in order to be whole. Wow. Uh, When it comes to gender-affirming care, there's only one path to change into another person. That's, That's quite a statement. And, and Mark, the other thing that really stood out for me is the fact that that one path is not scientific based. It's evidence based. And that is a very confusing term because that was uh, one of the phrases when I started reading about just everything going on in the public school system. And you read the backup from all of these doctors and medical associations, yeah. and they consistently use the phrase evidence based solutions. They don't use the phrase scientific based or medicine based or, and, and I was, I'm like, okay, evidence based. Yeah, that's great evidence. But the evidence, all the evidence that they need to draw these conclusions is the consensus of the doctors making these decisions. Exactly. They pick and choose their evidence. They pick and choose. Uh, and, and so it's so deceiving the way that they are really lying to the public on how they use these phrases. Yeah, once again, uh, we are listening to testimony from the House Judiciary Subcommittee on the Constitution and Limited Government, which has recently held hearings on the dangers and due process violations of gender-affirming care for children. So, George, we have another clip that we think is going to be really important to hear. And this one is from uh, May Mailman, who is the senior legal fellow for the Independent Women's Law Center. I didn't know much about this organization, but I'm coming to find out that they really do some wonderful things. So I think it's worthwhile for our listeners to follow them. This testimony goes to talking about Title IX of the Education Amendments of our Civil Rights Laws. I think it goes back to 1972 and how they are now being weaponized to uh, uh, foment uh, the whole industry around gender-affirming care and deny people their real rights as it was originally articulated under Title IX for these laws. So let's hear the testimony from May Mailman. I'm May Mailman, Senior Fellow with the Independent Women's Law Center, the legal advocacy arm of Independent Women's Forum and Independent Women's Voice. I'm also a mother to my eight-month-old daughter, I am testifying here today in support of her future, her freedom, and her equal opportunity. My fellow panelists have covered the pernicious effects of gender ideology on children and their futures. I am here to address another way in which gender ideology destroys women and girls, and that is by dissolving legal protections for women in athletics. Until recently, female student-athletes might have thought that they were protected by Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972, and they were. That's because Title IX is very simple. It prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in programs run by schools that accept federal money, and that's basically all of them, and those programs include sports. Title IX recognizes that providing equal opportunity for the sexes can mean recognizing inherent differences between the sexes, That's why the Title IX statute explicitly allows schools to provide different living arrangements for the sexes. So, too, in sports. 
In introducing Title IX, Senator Birch Bayh explained that Title IX would not require sticking women on men's football teams. And that's why Congress explicitly asked that the initial Title IX regulations include reasonable provisions considering the nature of particular sports. And so for 50 years, the Title IX athletics regulation has explicitly permitted sex-based teams where selections for such teams is based on competitive skill or involves a contact sport. Importantly, the regulations also require that schools must provide equal opportunities for members of both sexes. Unfortunately, in April of this year, the Department of Education proposed a rule that, if adopted, would flip Title IX on its head. The proposed rule would modify the athletic regulation to let schools uh, compete on teams consistent with their gender identity unless a particular school can demonstrate to the satisfaction of the Department of Education that this policy would be too unfair or unsafe. In other words, women are no longer granted female sports teams as a given. We have to prove that we need it. Of course, we do need it. Studies show that even testosterone suppression cannot eliminate the male advantage, except schools are not going to be allowed to say that as a general matter, post-pubescent biological males playing women's sports puts female athletes at risk of injury and losing playing time, medals, and privacy. No, schools are going to have to prove to federal bureaucrats that allowing a biological male on a woman's team would be unfair or unsafe in this particular sport with respect to these particular athletes. No school is going to want to take on that litigation risk, and so schools are going to allow biological males to compete on women's sports. This will directly and overwhelmingly harm female athletes who are far more likely to be displaced by a male athlete than vice versa and far more likely to face risks in private spaces like locker rooms. And even if it were a good idea to reduce educational opportunities for women like this, the Department of Education may not do so unless this body has authorized it. But Congress has done no such thing. The Department of Education says that the Supreme Court's decision in Bostick versus Clayton County means it can pretend that Title IX addresses gender identity. But the Department of Education is wrong. In Bostick, the Supreme Court said that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act prohibits employers from firing someone just because they are transgender. The decision says that an employee's sex is not relevant to the selection, evaluation, or compensation of employees. Athletics and education, however, is governed by a different law, Title IX. And when it comes to athletics, sex is not only relevant, it is often dispositive. As superstar Serena Williams said, men's and women's tennis are completely different sports. We live in a nation of laws and not bureaucratic command. That means the Department of Education must find its authorities in the laws that this legislative body has considered and passed. It may not use gender ideology to twist a simple anti-discrimination statute into a statute that reduces opportunities for women. Thank you. That was a somewhat complex testimony. Um, our listeners can listen to it again to, uh, to get the uh, the full content of it. But basically, uh, what she is saying is that the Biden administration is corrupting our yeah. civil rights laws to suit their own political purposes. We have talked about this in the past, George, uh, but this is ongoing. Uh, that, that's not what the law was originally intended for, to make sex in Title IX or Title VII, for that fact, mean sexual orientation or gender identity. But that is what they are trying to do. And uh, and, and even in the Bostock ruling, uh, the ma- majority, um, I think it was Neil Gorsuch who wrote was. the opinion on behalf of the majority. And he stated there very clearly that this decision is narrow uh, and it, it's uh, applicable, you know, to to the workplace. Only Title Seven. Only Title Seven. In fact, that was explicitly stated in his opinion. Correct. And so we, we all knew that the Biden administration was just going to take this and fly willy nilly with it, try to circumvent the judicial process um, and the judicial branch, uh, which is uh, the branch that enacts laws. It's not the executive branch. 
So this is just going really crazy. It really is, George. And uh, what we haven't played is testimony from the opposition. Um, our listeners are free to go on the Judiciary Committee's website, and they can listen to it from, for themselves. But um, I was just so shocked at their opposition to policies protecting children and families, and they base it on three premises. Number one, they state that all professional medical associations – uh, support gender-affirming care. And unfortunately, George, that's true. They have yeah. been completely politicized. And, of course, there's a profit motive to doing these procedures, these experimental procedures. And, and Mark, just one more thing to note for parents is that uh, if you look at the history of when all of these medical professional associations changed their policy and their stance on this, it's all been in the last few years. Not because some huge studies came out revealing that, oh, we, we were wrong. We got the science wrong. Right. No, it's strictly because of the political pressure uh, that has come from the far left. That's right. And as was stated in the earlier testimony, um, European countries, ironically, are going the complete opposite direction, yeah. uh, particularly the Scandinavian countries who are on the vanguard in the past 20 years, the, the most gender identity affirming nations on earth. They have seen the consequences of these policies and they have turned to 180 degrees. George, we need to learn from their experience. Definitely. And POK is all about parental rights. And ironically, as we stated in uh, last week's episode, that's another argument that they're making is that the state should not have to get in between parents and children who are deciding that they want the child to transition to another gender. And as we stated before, no parent should be able to permanently sterilize and mutilate their children on the basis of a recent ideology, which encourages the persistence of a psychological malady and rejects a child's inherent biology established at conception. Exactly, exactly. And and Mark, going back to two episodes ago at episode 122, where we talked about the infringement on parental rights by the state of California, who is you know run by far left ideologues and they're using parental rights here to state that well no no we should let parents decide but yet in california they're saying no no no, you don't get to choose it's which way do you want to have it (laughs) that's right it's a a two-sided argument and uh, fortunately george uh, there's some guarded optimism and as you well know in california uh, parents are raising up in arms to resist these policies particularly as they're applied in the public school system in fact a a famous uh, thing just happened recently in the chino valley unified school district where they passed a policy saying that if a school official knows that there's a child who wants to transition or is uh, identifying with another gender, the parents must be notified. Now, you would think that would be a common sense provision. But as you know, George, uh, Tony Thurman, the California Mm -hmm. State Superintendent, personally showed up at this uh, board meeting to oppose this common sense policy. Fortunately, it was passed by the school board. And uh, unfortunately, uh, for the supervisor of the school district, she's faced tremendous acrimony and even death, death threats, threats yep. a- as a result of this. So parents, now is the time to stand up for our children, for common sense, for helping our kids be kids yep. and not be sucked in to this horrible, horrible ideology. Well, Mark, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you very much for those who have been listening to our podcast. You can visit us on our website at protectourkidsnow.org. We encourage you to share our videos, our podcasts, our brochures. We have a lot of great content uh, that is easy to share. If you want Mark and I to come and speak at uh, your local group, uh, your church, uh, we'd be more than happy to. Just click on the Invite a Speaker button. Um, as well as there is a donate button if you want to continue to support our mission here to uh, help inform and educate parents uh, all across the country on the dangers, uh, what we call the triple threat to children in the public school system. Uh, Thank you so much for listening and for watching, and we'll see you next time on Say What? 
You've been listening to Say What, the radio ministry of Protect Our Kids, where they seek to inform and equip concerned citizens about the crisis in American public education and the forces working against our children. Join us at this same time every Saturday as attorney Mark Schneider and Pastor George Rosca Jr. unpack the issues so that we can better safeguard our nation's children. And join Mark and George right here next week at this same time for another episode of Say What. 